request and ask that you would bless each one. We pray this all in your son's name. Amen. All right. I'm going to share a little bit with you about our scripture and about the theme so that um, you're not, you, we have some element of, of, uh, of hearing from God's word this morning. Um, you see what this is? Does that, rec- does that look familiar? Around the ends of your pews? Even pastors forget their Bibles. It needs to use one. Turn to Mark 10 with me. Mark 10, looking at verse 32. Or it's conveniently on the screen. Thank you, Eric. Mark 10, 32. They were on their way up to Jerusalem, with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. He began to look, and he again he took the twelve aside and told them what he was going what was going to happen to to him. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. All right, so how many of you have ever had a toddler age kids or have worked with that age group before? Many, many. And a lot of you will know that at that age group, it's crucial to give them a warning when something will end and to help them know what's going to happen next. I know that very much just from simply Emily working with preschool students and we have a niece that's a toddler age and we spend a lot of time with her, so I've learned. But I also know that when that doesn't happen, the next hour or so, if you're lucky, is very detrimental, to say the least. And Emily and I have the privilege of working with a little boy that we've come very fond of and very close to. Um, And he's given me even a greater awareness for helping them know what happens next. You see, he has a mild form of autism, and one symptom of of that is um, they have trouble transitioning from one activity to another. So... The, the warning that something is going to end and the, the explanation of what's going to happen next is very crucial for them to have their best outcome possible. And, you know, thinking through this passage, uh, it reminds me a little bit of what Paul said, that um, we need milk, not solid food, for some are still infants in the faith. In Mark, though, we find that this is not the first, it's not even the second time, it's the third time that he lets the disciples know what is going to happen. And I don't think that that was a mistake. It was very intentional on Jesus' part. In terms of spiritual things, the disciples were very much toddlers. They needed to be warned, told, and made aware of the impending events that would take place to the one person who was leading them and who they loved and respected so much. And it says that they were astonished at something that Jesus did, right? If we look further into the Greek language, we can kind of use the word surprise synonymous with the word astonished. Um, but the one, one of the things that Mark makes sure that, we want, that he wants us to know is that Jesus was leading them to Jerusalem. And it was a rabbinic custom that the teacher of the group would lead or would, in many other instances in Scripture, it would say, would go on ahead of them. 
because this was the third time that he had shared what would happen to them, they knew that at the very least that going to Jerusalem was not going to be a pleasant thing. In fact, it probably was the very last thing that they wanted to do. But Passover was approaching. Despite that, Jesus is still leading them in confidence during the time that, if I'm frank, was just plain terrible and would be very horrible for Jesus. Jesus' persistent determination in the face of danger surprised the disciples. It also says that some others were following and were afraid. And I can understand why the others were a little afraid. They may not have had the same kind of interactions that the disciples would have had with Jesus. But I'm a little puzzled by the surprise the astonishment from the, from the disciples, leading them to Jesus. And you know, as we, as we continue reading, he explains everything that would happen to him from the flogging, from the spitting, from the insults, even death. But more importantly, he explains resurrection. In Luke 18, which is kind of a mirror image of this passage, we read in Luke 18 almost exactly what we read in Mark 10, except there's a little bit of difference. And and Luke explains that what Jesus said to them fulfilled everything that was written about the Son of Man in the prophets. And you know, everything means everything, from the suffering all the way to the joy. But if we look even further at the end of Luke 18, it says that the disciples didn't understand what he was saying. And they didn't know what he was talking about. What? Three times, guys. We can relate this back to the surprise the disciples had about uh, Jesus leading them to Jerusalem. Remember that the disciples journeyed with Jesus for close to three years. They knew who he was. They knew him. And as I said before, this was not new information to them. They've heard it before. They would have remembered the details about what he was saying. I mean, if, if someone that, you're, that you love, that you cared for, that you followed for so many years tells them that he's going to go to Jerusalem and suffer a painful death, that's something I would remember but maybe not understand fully, but I would remember. Maybe fear took over their understanding and caused them not to be able to, or maybe it was just not the right time for them to fully grasp what all of the implications were with this. One thing is certain, When Resurrection Day comes, all Jesus will have to say is, I told you so, because of his undeniable disclosure to them. So what's this mean for us? You know that that we have the whole story, right? We have the whole story. The disciples had part of it. They had what the prophets had spoken. But they were living out the second part of the story. We have a distinct advantage to be prepared for what happens next. We don't know specifics, but we know that times will get tough, and it'll get worse before it gets better. 
We know that false prophets and corrupt theology will infiltrate everything that God had intended to be pure and holy. We know that Jesus said that we'll see trouble. But he follows that and says, I have overcome the world. Just as the disciples may have had barriers causing them to not understand and know what Jesus was saying, we might have our own barriers too that cause us to miss the undeniable disclosure of what he's done for us. We're all hopefully moving from milk to mashed peas or whatever your preference is as a toddler. I guess younger than a toddler. To solid food. But to do that, we must put aside our fleshy behaviors, believe what we read from Scripture, and allow God to bring us the understanding just as he did to the disciples, when it's our time to understand. How is Jesus undeniably disclosing himself to you? The truth's been revealed to us. There's nothing hidden. Everything has been disclosed. It's ultimately up to us what we do with it. Let us undeniably claim Jesus as Lord and Savior. He was handed over to the Gentiles, was mocked, was spit on, insulted, flogged, and killed. Let us undeniably claim that Jesus rose from the dead on the third day, defeating the power of death and sin. Let us go forth proclaiming what Jesus Christ has done for us and that he offers salvation to each one. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for infusing it into our hearts. Help us to change our lives. We love and praise you.